good morning and Merry Christmas. Welcome to a very unique worship here at Lake Hills United Methodist Church. It is such an honor to be able to come to you wherever you are watching this, whether it be at home, with family, friends, or maybe you are someone who is working today, and we say thank you for doing that because that means you are either keeping us safe, taking care of us, or serving us. So we're doing this service a little differently today because it is Christmas morning, and he, we here at Lake Hills United Methodist Church wanted to give you an opportunity for you to just spend a little extra time at the manger to really ponder and think about the birth of Christ without having to get everybody up and around and breakfast and dressed and rush over to the church. So enjoy today's worship. Now you may think what we're doing today is a little different, and it is. It's a little history behind it. When my sons were growing up, we had a tradition that we would read a Christmas book and the Christmas story on Christmas Eve, and then we'd read another Christmas book on the morning of Christmas Day. And my sons now are, you know, 39, 38, and 34, and they don't get into it probably as much as I do. But I think all of us adults, every once in a while, enjoy having a story read to us. And so the story I'm going to read to you today is one of my favorite. It is called The Tale of Three Trees. So sit back, grab a cup of coffee, a tea, whatever it is that you want to have, and just listen for how God is speaking to you through the words of this story. So this is The Tale of Three Trees, a traditional folktale retold by Angela Elwell Hunt. Once upon a mountaintop, three little trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. The first tree looked up at the stars twinkling like diamonds above him. I want to hold treasure, he said. I want to be covered with gold and filled with precious stones. I will be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world. The second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. I want to be a strong sailing ship, he said. I want to travel mighty waters and carry powerful kings. I will be the strongest ship in the world. The third little tree looked down into the valley below where busy men and busy women worked in a busy town. I don't want to leave this mountaintop at all, she said. I want to grow so tall that when people stop to look at me, they will raise their eyes to heaven and think of God. I will be the tallest tree in the world.
years passed. The rains came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter looked at the first tree and said, This tree is beautiful. It is perfect for me. And with a swoop of his shining axe, the first tree fell. Now I shall be made into a beautiful chest, thought the first tree. I shall hold wonderful treasure. The second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, This tree is strong. It is perfect for me. With a swoop of his shining axe, the second tree fell. Now I shall sail mighty waters, thought the second tree. I shall be a strong ship fit for kings. The third tree felt her heart sink when the last woodcutter looked her way. She stood straight and tall and pointed bravely to heaven. But the woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered. And with a swoop of his shining axe, the third tree fell. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought him to a carpenter's shop. But the busy carpenter was not thinking about treasure chests. Instead, his work-worn hands fashioned the tree into a feed box for animals. And the once beautiful tree was not covered with gold or filled with treasure. He was coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took him to a shipyard, but no mighty sailing ships were being made that day. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. Too small and too weak to sail an ocean or even a river, he was taken to a little lake. And every day he brought in loads of dead, smelly fish. The third tree was confused when the woodcutter cut her into strong beams and left her in a lumber yard. What happened? The once tall tree wondered. All I ever wanted to do was stay on the mountaintop and point to God. Well, many, many days and nights passed. The three trees nearly forgot their dreams. But one night, golden starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby into the feed box. I wish I could make a cradle for him, her husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled as the starlight shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. This manger is beautiful, she said. And suddenly, the first tree knew he was holding the greatest treasure in the world.
one evening, a tired traveler and his friends crowded into the old fishing boat. The traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out into the lake. Soon a thundering and thrashing storm arose, and the little tree shuddered. He knew he did not have the strength to carry so many passengers safely through the wind and rain. The tired man awakened. He stood up, stretched out his hand, and said, Peace. The storm stopped as quickly as it had begun. And suddenly, the second tree knew he was carrying the king of heaven and earth. One Friday morning, the third tree was startled when her beams were yanked from the forgotten woodpile. She flinched as she was carried through an angry, jeering crowd. And she shuddered when soldiers nailed a man's hands to her. She felt ugly, harsh, and cruel. But on Sunday morning... When the sun rose and the earth trembled with joy beneath her, the third tree knew that God's love had changed everything. It had made the first tree beautiful. It had made the second tree strong. And every time people thought of the third tree, they would think of God. There was nothing better than being the tallest tree in the world.
I just love this story. It often speaks to the human condition. You see, all three trees had big dreams for their lives, and when they wanted those to happen, didn't happen, and they weren't happy. And those trees then thought that their lives weren't important, that the lives were over, their stories were done, that their timing was bad. I recently read a story about a married woman who decided to go off on a private vacation to Europe. And she went from the Midwest to London. And she was planning on that trip to go to Paris and then Rome and Vienna. So when she got to her first stop in London, she called her husband back home in the Midwest and said, how are you doing? And her husband said, well, I'm doing fine, but our cat Lucy died. So the wife starts bawling her eyes out on that phone. And when she regains her composure, she says, you're an insensitive brute of a man. Why did you give me such horrible news when I'm thousands of miles away from home? Don't you care about my feelings? Well, the husband paused a moment. He said, well, what was I supposed to say? The wife thinks for a moment. She says, well, when I got to London and I called you like I did, you could have just said, Lucy, the cat is on the roof. Then when I get to Paris, you could say, Lucy, our cat fell off the roof. And when I get to Rome, then you could say, Lucy is not doing so well. Then when I go to Vienna and I call you, then is when you could say, Lucy died. Then the wife said, by the way, how is mother? And the husband responded, she's on the roof. (laughs) That poor husband really didn't understand poor timing. I want you to think about if there's ever been a situation in your life where you felt the timing of something was bad. When I was in seminary, a classmate felt God calling him and his young bride to move from Oklahoma to Austin, Texas, so he could get his Master's of Divinity degree and become ordained in his denomination. They had just recently been married. And while he was in seminary, his wife began working as a school teacher to support the family so he could be a full-time student. Um, Not long after he started seminary, they'd learned that she was pregnant and they had an adorable baby boy. And almost immediately, within days of the birth of that precious boy, his wife was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. She had to quit her job because she had surgery and underwent chemo and radiation. All of this happening while the husband was still a full-time student. Now he became also a full-time caretaker for his wife, the only parent able to take care of his son. And yet he had to stay a full-time student because of a scholarship he had been awarded. Timing wasn't good for their family, huh? You know, I wonder how Jesus... Mother Mary felt about timing when the angel Gabriel approached her when she was, oh, 14 or 15 years old and told her that the Holy Spirit would come upon her and that she would become impregnated and would become the mother of the Savior of the world. You see, at the time, Mary was not married, and she was betrothed to be married, though, and she lived in a much more conservative culture than our own today. So for Mary to become pregnant out of wedlock, well, that would have just sent her straight into scandal. And to make matters worse, for any women who have been pregnant, in her ninth month, she had to travel, most likely walking, sometimes on a donkey, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. That's bad timing, right? Because her fiancé Joseph had to go there Um, to register for the census that Caesar Augustus had issued to be taken of the Roman world. Now, if we just focus the camera only on Mary, the timing of that pregnancy doesn't seem very good. Yet she doesn't complain, even though for us now, it doesn't sound like the best of circumstances. But from God's perspective, Timing was perfect. Galatians 4, 4 tells us this. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent his son, 
born of a woman, born under the law. What does that expression mean? When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. Well, the expression fullness of time means when the time is ripe, when the time is perfect, and it was then that God sent forth Jesus to be the savior of the world. Throughout history, God had been whispering and promising that he would send a savior. Even all the way back into the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and fell away from God, when they experienced a sense of alienation, not only between themselves and God, but between each other and with their own hearts, even then God was promising that he was going to send a savior for them and for all humanity. Many, many years later, God approached a Middle Eastern nomad named Abraham and his wife Sarah. They were an elderly couple, like in their 90s and hundreds, and they had struggled for decades with infertility. And God told them, you are going to miraculously conceive, and through generations beginning with your son, there will be one that is born who will bless the nations of the world. That blessing was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God would then approach one of Abraham's many times removed great-grandsons, King David, and he told him that the king would have an offspring in the future who would sit on the throne forever and ever, and his reign would know no end. The offspring God was referring to was Jesus Christ, the king of kings, Lord of lords. Throughout scripture, God promises us a savior. And as Paul said in Galatians, in the fullness of time, in the perfect time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Now in hindsight, if you've done any studying of scripture at all, you know that politically, culturally, even spiritually, it was the perfect time for Christ to be born. Times back then were hard. People were struggling. And so God, through his angel Gabriel, came to Mary and said to her, you will experience the Holy Spirit, and you will give birth to the Savior of the world. Yes, it was bad timing for Mary because she was an unwed mother. But through Mary's voluntary yes, God was achieving God's grand purpose. You know, we see that not only true of Mary's response, but of people's responses throughout Scripture. One of my favorite stories of how God uses people's responses to achieve God's purpose is the story of Joseph. Joseph was the great-great-grandson of Abraham. He was one of 12 boys. I just, as a mother of three, I go, 12 boys? And he was Jacob's favorite. Because of that, as you might imagine, Joseph's brothers were very jealous of him and resented him. So they betrayed him and sold him as a slave. And they convinced their father that Joseph had been killed by a ravenous wild beast. As a slave in Egypt, Joseph started working for a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar's wife took notice of Joseph quickly because Joseph was a good-looking dude. Well, one day when Potiphar was out of the house, Potiphar's wife made a pass at Joseph. But Joseph rejected her because he didn't want to dishonor God. Potiphar's wife was so offended and probably a little embarrassed by being snubbed by this young man that when her husband came home, she lied about Joseph to Potiphar so that her husband would do something to Joseph out of jealousy. Joseph was sent to prison, but eventually released. And because of his exceptional gifts, and especially because God's hand was upon him, Joseph rose and became the prime minister of Egypt. Later, a famine broke out in that region, and Joseph's brothers became hungry, and they heard that there was an excess of grain in Egypt. So the brothers traveled and went and stood in front of the prime minister of Egypt, their brother, but they didn't recognize him. And they asked for grace and for grain. Now Joseph was tempted to conceal his identity, but he couldn't. 
He said to his brothers, don't you recognize me? I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold. Well, his brothers quickly became deathly afraid. They thought that their brother would retaliate, even possibly kill them or make them slaves in in order to equal the score. But Joseph told them, please don't be afraid. Can't you see, though, that what you did to me was motivated by evil, that God will do good through it for the saving of many lives. Throughout scripture and often I believe in many of our own lives, we see that God can take all that we do, our good choices and, yes, our bad ones, but God can work them for good. God can also take the bad things that happen in our lives if we lean into God And God will take those things and choreograph them for God's purposes. What we have to do is realize that God is God and we are not. In this book, The Three Trees, that I just read to you, those trees felt life was over because their dreams were not coming true. But then, then they learned that God's dreams, God's desires were that they were to become integral parts of the greatest story ever told. They were all part of the life of Jesus. And those three trees found importance in ways that they had never imagined. And it's the same way with your and my life. Romans 8, 28 tells us, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Today is Christmas Day, a day that we not only think about baby Jesus being born and coming into the world, but it's also a day that we should open up our hearts for Jesus to come into our very world at this time. And I think the timing is fitting because counting today There's only six days left to the year 2022. So today, as a birthday gift to Jesus, I think we should take a moment to look back at this past year and ask ourselves some questions. Did you always love God perfectly with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Or were there times when you put what you wanted or what you thought were your needs before God's way. In 2022, did you always love your neighbors like Jesus loves you? Or were there times you put your needs, wants, and desires above the good of others? In these last 12 months, did you always view those around you as people that God already loves Or were there times you thought you were better than them because they were others? They were different in all different ways, how they looked, their politics, how they lived, how they spent their money, or how they even got their money. Well, true confession time. I know I haven't always lived up to God's expectations in these past 12 months. So, as a birthday gift for Jesus... Let's decide today to make a resolution to be better. We don't even have to wait for New Year's Day to make this resolution. Let's decide right now that we're going to make a better, bigger and better effort to learn more about our own relationship with God and then to live and do things each and every day the way Jesus would want us to do. And when we do that, we also then can become part of the greatest story God has ever told by helping to build God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in the next six days? Heck, who knows what's going to happen even today? Maybe you don't get that Christmas present you have coveted and given so many hints about to a loved one. Yeah, because maybe their timing was off. You know, I can pretty much predict there will be good times and there will be trials. 
not just in the next six days, but also in the upcoming year 2023. But here's the most amazing thing. Regardless of what joys and sorrows you are currently experiencing, regardless of what may happen in your life in the next year, the Lord's plans for you for these next six days of 2022 and in this new year coming up, these are plans of hope, joy, peace, and love. All you have to do is just put your own desires ahead or aside and live your life for Christ. You know, Jeremiah 29 tells us, for surely I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Now, if that isn't a sign of a God who loves us, I don't know what is. Because today is, the, is Jesus' birthday, but yet it's us who receives the most amazing Christmas gift ever. The birth of Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Merry Christmas. You know, I think on that note, I think we should sing joy to the world. What do you think? And to sing that song, I think we just need to really stand and belt it out. And all of you, wherever you are watching us from, join in with us. Today, take some time, talk with friends, family, whoever it might be. Maybe it's a stranger. Wish them Merry Christmas. Because remember, it was in the manger that we now start our journey, even on Christmas Day, towards Jesus and the cross. So on this day of Christmas, may the love of Jesus Christ surround you. May the mystery of the Holy Spirit astound you. And may the grace, peace, hope, joy, and love that can only come from God ground you. Go now to serve others just like Jesus would do. Merry Christmas all and blessings.